Kill a Piano, episode 16. I'm George Tate. Thanks for being here. Is it possible to sleep without dreaming? Dream Culture by Onerous Gray taught me that dreams help us make sense of the waking world. That's why even the most outlandish dreams still speak to the realities of open eyes. It's said that we have on average four to even six different dreams a night, but we forget most of them. What we remember is the last dream that manifests closest to when we wake up. Those still can fade quickly, blending into the fabric of our waking moments where they become difficult to distinguish the real from the dreaming world. In a strange bit of irony, rapid eye movement, you know, when our eyes dart back and forth side to side in our head while we're asleep, rapid eye movement impairs our own ability to form memories. A bit of a cosmic joke, if you ask me. Our longest dreams occur in the morning and are usually the last dream we have before waking. Most of our muscles are paralyzed during REM sleep. This is our body's defense mechanism that keeps us from acting out our dreams and sleepwalking to our death. It's not an invaluable system, but it's mostly effective. There's very little sound in our dreams. The part of the brain that has that little voice that makes sense of the world quiets down, nearly shuts down completely when we're sleeping. Our dreams often don't make sense because our brain literally doesn't allow them to make sense. Nightmares. Nightmares only occur in the last third of our sleep cycle. That means we'll never start a dream inside a nightmare. Sleep always starts with something pleasant. And isn't that a comforting thought, even if you aren't likely to remember it? Nightmares end up in the longest time slot of our mental moving picture show. Even the blind experience their dreams and nightmares as images in their mind and not like the darkness of the waking world. You might say nightmares are a place we helplessly end up after getting lost in our dreams. Like death, it's an inevitable fate-filled ending for all of us who are helplessly lost in life. Chapter 13, The Second Attempt While the monsters are still on my bedroom walls keeping guard of the space around me, they haven't always kept guard of my dreams very well. My subconscious often holds space for the nightmares where I find myself in a gray concrete room with no doors and no windows. The floor is covered in broken glass, and while everything else moves in black and white, I see the lustrous glass glowing in shades of greens, browns, and blues. The clear glass pieces reflect the others and blend with the gray of the cement floor. I look down and find myself barefoot. There's no place to move. I'm standing in the only space that won't cut me open. A doorway appears. While at first it feels like it's across the room, I realize it's in the center of it, and I'm at the edge. I'm comfortable at first. The severity of the situation doesn't sink in until the cold of the cement starts to feel wet beneath my toes. I realize the room is slowly beginning to fill with water, and the door is slowly sinking into the cement, vanishing away my only chance to escape. If I want to get out, I'll need to walk across the floor barefoot, across the glass, or I'll drown with no way out. I take my first step out of my circle of comfort, and that's when I felt it. The pointed corners of the thick broken glass pushing into the soft skin beneath me. I take another step, then another, and another, four, then five, The glass crunches beneath my heels. My toes dance amongst the jagged edges of the glass fragments. On the 19th step, I finally make it to the door, only to discover that it's locked and that the key 
is dangling from a thread above the safe space where I started. The water is now ankle deep as I carefully start my journey back towards the edge of the room where I began. I reluctantly step once, then once more, and once more. Four, then five, then six steps. The glass continues to crunch into complex jagged edges beneath me. Seven, then eight, then nine steps. My feet doing their best to absorb the impact as sharp blades of glass glide through my skin through all 19 steps. As I arrive back at the circle and reach for the key, my feet twist against the cement and I feel the remnants of a shard lodged into the flesh of my left foot. The Don't water drown. beneath me turns pink Don't drown. as my blood mixes Don't into the liquid foundation of the room. The as I turn to step back to the only exit of the room, the door has almost sunk down to the doorknob. I step so quickly. quickly. Five steps, ten Five steps, steps, nineteen. Steps last one. I kneel last and one. I struggle with the key in the door. The glass cuts my into my knees through my pants and somehow I manage to get the door open and crawl through to the other side. I'm safe. Thank goodness I'm safe. Here, I find myself in a concrete room with no windows and and no doors. I have no idea how I got here. The room is quickly filling with water and it's up to my knees. The floor of the water-filled room is covered in broken glass. I don't want to Everything moves in black and white. I look down and find my feet are bleeding out. I'm gonna die. I'm submerged in the room. A door appears, and I realize I have to get to the center and away from the walls. I've done this before. There isn't enough water to swim, and I realize if I wait, the door will have sunk down deep into the floor, and there will be no chance for me to have much air. Once the water takes over. I also remember I never learned to swim and I can only hold my breath for so long. The water is now up to my waist. The doorknob has nearly sunk into the floor. Tears roll down my face as my feet are stung by the cold water rushing into the gashes of my feet. I can feel every crunch, but it's muted by the water. I barely make it to the door in time, and I turn the handle, but it's locked, and my key no longer fits. I look back to where I started as the water rises to my neck, and I look up to see that there's a new key dangling above me, and that's when I realize I'm going to drown, and there's no escape unless I wake up. I hear the rev on a car engine, and then a car horn blasts momentarily. Sounds like aquaphobia, Charlie said matter-of-factly while smiling into the rearview mirror at the idiot behind us, impatient to get through the stop sign that we had just come to rest at. What? I said, snapping out of my daydream as we made our way back from the piano lesson. It's a specific phobia. You know, it's an irrational fear of something that doesn't cause much danger in real life. You've always been nervous around water, but what you're describing is impossible and never going to happen. Don't be scared of your dreams, even if they are nightmares, Charlie comforted. My mind was spinning the rest of the drive home. Was I telling Charlie about my nightmare? Did I fall asleep? Was I talking in my sleep? For that matter, did everything during the piano lesson really happen? If it did, how could Charlie not know? How could a person, my person, that I grew up looking up to, found comfort in, who kept me safe, have such a rich history that neither of us knew anything about. I wanted to ask Charlie all sorts of questions, and for the first time in our history, I wasn't able to. I had that dream often, and I was surprised that I told Charlie about it. You need to find another way to channel those images into something positive, Charlie advised. What do you mean? How do you propose I do that? I stopped dazing out the window and turned my head towards Charlie. As I looked over at the man driving, I noticed a man I had never met before, but I also still saw the Uncle Charlie I grew up with. I saw a man who sang Cat Stevens whenever it blasted over the radio. I saw the man whose eyes lit up when he was picking out the perfect, imperfect produce. 
I heard the laugh of a man who giggled in excitement whenever he finished a decent puzzle. Not one of those jigsaw puzzles, but any kind he could manipulate in his hands for more than a few moments to a satisfying end. I saw my Uncle Charlie. The Uncle Charlie who taught me to drive a stick shift and was patient as I juggled to find the balance between the gas pedal and the clutch that first time. The Charlie that never raised his voice at me, even when I know I've tried his patience on more than one occasion. I saw a man who was caring, who was loving, who always listened. He was compassionate, thoughtful, and apparently doesn't know what story he's in. I suppose that's what it's like for everyone. You grow up knowing only a small part of the people around you in the present, and rarely do you learn their past. The mistake we often make is that we assume we're the start of a story, when most often we're coming in at the end of someone else's. Charlie pulled the car into our driveway, and I unbuckled my lap belt and opened the door. The shoulder belt whirred as it ran along its track to release me. I need to run a few errands. I'll be back home this evening. Is there anything you'd like me to pick up for dinner? Charlie queried, through a smile as I opened the back door of the car and grabbed my backpack from the back seat. Surprise me? I couldn't slow my mind down enough to consider Charlie's question. I needed a moment alone to collect my thoughts. You okay, sport? <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I flung my backpack onto my left shoulder and shut the car door. Go in and have a cup of tea. The new stuff that I brought home from Quan at the tea spot. I left it on the baker's rack next to the stove in the Ouija tea box. Charlie pulled away and I headed inside. I filled the kettle and began to heat the water to a boil. I pulled down the Ouija tea box from the rack. I should clarify, there wasn't anything magical about the tea box. It simply had an engraving of a talking board on the lid. As far as I know, all talking boards are bullshit. It had a mechanism inside it that unlocked by running a magnetic planchet over the right letters. In this case, you spelled T, T-E-A, and the lock released. Inside, I found oat straw tea. This was one of Charlie's favorites that we rarely had around the house. When we did, it was always special. Usually, we only shared it together while sitting at the tea spot. I poured some of the loose tea into a diffuser and dropped it into the mug. As I waited for the water to boil, I began to empty my backpack of the sheet music and notebooks I always carried with me to my lessons. Among them, I curiously discovered a new book had appeared. Sarah must have slipped it into my bag when I wasn't looking. It was a small hardback book wrapped in a gray cloth material, no taller than six inches. I ran my fingers along the silver embossed lettering on the cover that read, Invisible Perception. The author's name was faded at the bottom edge, rubbed away with time. I could only make out a couple of letters, R, I, C. Well, Mr. Rick, let's see what Sarah wanted me to learn from you. I opened the book to find that the first few pages were torn out and missing. There was no table of contents. There was no publishing date. There was no author on the inside. If there was another book like this one in the world, it most certainly started differently. The first page of readable text fell in the middle of a sentence. It read, Is the most destructive deception. It continued, Life may be lived like a poem and played like a piece of sheet music. There's always room to add your own voice to the songs. We all need to learn to play together. We're all searching for answers. To discover them, we need to educate ourselves to inquire with the proper questions. There's been the same war brewing for centuries, and it will only conclude when we enlighten our minds that it's not us versus them. There's only us, and that's everyone. Both sides must be convinced of this, or I fear one side will feel like it's winning the battle while we'll all fall and lose the war together. Resentment devours everything it feeds upon. It's forever famished. Even once it's feasted, it moves on to its next victims to destroy. I've seen this over and over throughout time. We've discovered three simple chords of interest, and depending on what order and octave they're played, they'll resonate different results. Surely, there are even more arrangements waiting to be discovered. There are 8,400 different chords that may be created out of the 88 keys. 
That leaves 592,492,336,800 different combinations of three that we're experimenting with one at a time. While many combinations seem to do little more than make us cringe at the sound they create, the following pages record what we've found to be useful and what we've managed to discover so far. As I flip the pages of the book, the text described different series of chords and what effects they created. It seemed to depend on where and how they're played. The text explained that music had the power to release certain chemicals in our brain. One set affected motor control that seemed to stop time for one person while everything else continued to vibrate around it. Another affected vision, creating the illusion that time stopped around us. This could be used to freeze inanimate objects. Another set brought people together, another aided in problem solving. There was even one set to treat insomnia. There was one listed that caught my attention that could distract us from pain, and yet another that said it could enhance the taste of food and drink. The kettle began to sing as it boiled. I stopped at mid-song and poured the water over the diffuser in my mug. I left the tea to steep and collected a few items to experiment with from around the house. I grabbed a bottle of isopropyl alcohol from the medicine cabinet in the lavatory. I collected a box of matches from the drawer in the kitchen. The curious book was small enough to slip into my back pocket. I then carried my cup of tea and the rest of the supplies down to the basement where the Hazleton was laying dormant. The piano was never very active during the daylight hours. It seemed it needed its rest, just like every other living thing, and sunshine did the trick. This is why Sarah always advised me to practice during the daylight hours and step away in the evenings. As I approached the Hazleton, the light bled through the basement windows. I could see the rays of sunshine sparkling on the dust between the books. We were alone, but I often felt like we were being carefully watched. I placed my tea down on a coaster on the dash of the piano to no reaction. I placed the bottle of alcohol on the opposite side of the dash and propped the box of matches on end beside it. I situated myself on the piano bench and I lifted the fallboard slowly, not wanting to startle it. I picked up the box of matches and held them at shoulder height and dropped them. I played a chord on the keys. The piano sang back in response to my keystroke, but otherwise had no response out of the ordinary. The matchbox hit the cement floor with a slight bounce. I reached down and picked up the matchbox again. What was that chord? My fingers struggled to find the page in the book and their place on the keys. After flipping through for a few minutes, I found Sarah's chord for the inanimate objects. I played three chords onto the piano in its upper registry with my right hand, held the matchbox with my left at shoulder height, and let it go. Whoa, it really works! To my surprise and amusement, the matchbox stayed perfectly suspended in space. It vibrated ever so slightly in place, but it didn't succumb to the force of gravity that should have taken it to the floor. I stared at the clock on the wall and drank my tea while I watched the second hand, timing how long it might take for the effects to dissipate. The strings of the piano stopped vibrating. The room was filled with the musical musings that most would consider silence, but are always filled with life if you listen closely enough. Four minutes passed, and the matchbook hadn't budged. Thirty more seconds passed, and the matchbox (laughs) fell to the ground. The drawer was forced open by the impact, scattering the matches. Charlie was frozen much longer than that, I screamed in my mind frustratingly. There has to be something I'm missing. I picked up the box and started again. This time, I played the same chords, but held the sustain pedal down with my toes. When I let go of the matchbox, it stayed suspended. I watched the clock. At the four and a half minute mark, I expected the box to come crashing down like it did last time, but it stayed still. Even after I lifted my foot from the pedal and began to pick up the matches that had scattered onto the floor. Interestingly, I could drop the matches with no abnormal effects. They hit the floor, but the matchbox stayed suspended. Twenty-four more minutes passed, and the little box was unmatched. Curiously, 
I found that I could push the matchbox drawer open and it would slide freely and fall to the floor, but the rest of the box stayed in place. It seemed that the cords only affected the outside of an object. At the 45 minute mark, the box sleeve circamed to gravity and fell to the ground. I struck one of the matches along the striking plate of the box and it flared to life. I brought the match to the wick of one of the candles that sat on the piano. I was ready to start my second experiment. I paged through the book and studied another set of chords. I brought my hand over to the candle flame and held it there as long as I could. After a few seconds, the heat was too much and I had to pull my hand away. Ow! I blew on my palm to cool it down. I attempted a second time, but this time, I struck a series of three chords in the lower register of the keys and held the sustain pedal in place. I returned my open palm over the flame and to my excitement, I felt nothing. As I held it there, I started to play a melody with my free hand. I held my skin over the flame for a full minute, then two, then three. I felt nothing. Once I pulled my hand away, the flesh was warm, but there was no singeing or visible damage to my skin. I was ready to take the experiments further. I was convinced that this book wasn't the made-up musings of a fool, but rather a great discovery that might help bring an end to the battle we've been waging at the center of the labyrinth of books. I carefully soaked my right hand with isopropyl alcohol. I nervously brought my soaked hand to the flame and it caught a blaze. I felt nothing. The glow of the flames danced on my face, and I stared in awe at my hand as the piano's soundboard continued to reverberate as I kept my foot on the pedal. I felt no pain as the flames danced over my skin as if it was the wick of a candlestick. As I began feeling the warmth of the flame on my hand, the flame quietly distinguished itself. I smiled as my mind formed a plan. This book has the secrets that can set us free, Charlie. At this point, Charlie had been gone quite some time, and I knew that didn't leave me with much more if I was going to give this a shot. I went upstairs and collected all the blankets from the linen closet and all of the blankets from the beds in the house and threw them down to the basement where they landed at the foot of the stairs. I then found my way out to the yard and collected the garden hose, coiling it around my arms and head back down the steps. I went into the laundry room and filled one of the buckets we always had under the sink with water and took it back to the piano, leaving the hose behind. I grabbed a book down from one of the shelves and struck the same chords that I hit to stop the matchbox from falling. Keeping my foot on the pedal, I thrust the book into the bucket of water for a few moments before removing it again. To my excitement, it came out completely unaffected. I safely tucked invisible perception into my back pocket and returned to the laundry room. I attached one end to the hose to the laundry sink spigot. I uncoiled the rest of the hose as I slowly weaved my way to the center of the library with the open end. I carefully moved everything away from the piano until all that was left in the labyrinth center was the Hazelton and the one end of the garden hose. I returned to the foot of the stairs for the blankets and used them to cover the piano, leaving only the keys exposed. I struck the same three chords again, followed by the three that allowed me to light my hand on fire. I held my foot on the pedal, programming the extra time I needed, and I carefully removed my foot and made my way back to the laundry sink to turn it on. The water ran along the inside of the hose, making its way across the floor like a snake stalking its lunch. I ran back to the center of the library in time to see the water start to spray out the other end. I observed the water as it filled in to cover the floor. The books stayed dry as they seemed to form the walls of an invisible bucket around the center of the room. As I watched the water rise from the other side of the invisible wall, the blankets began to wick the water up into them, weighing the piano down. As the water rose over the keys, the fallboard snapped shut, pulling the blankets with it. 
covering the Hazleton that was starting to stir, but it was too late. The soundboard began to flood with water submerging the strings, and I could hear the muted sounds of them struggling like they were gasping for air. I found myself feeling sorry for the creature. No living thing can survive without oxygen for very long, and I was knowingly depriving the piano of it. To my surprise, the Hazleton began to float itself up to the surface as the water level rose far above my head towards the ceiling. I returned to the laundry sink, turning off the flow of water and disconnected the hose. Water came rushing back through the other side, completely soaking me and the laundry room in the process. I managed to wrestle the hose into the drain of the floor before I returned to pay my respects to the remains of the Hazleton. Dripping from head to toe, I weaved back to the center where most of the water had now gone. I found the blankets clinging to the ceiling. As I pulled on the only corner I could reach, the weight of the blankets came tumbling down on top of me, pinning me momentarily to the floor. The piano was gone. It actually worked. I couldn't believe it. Later that evening, when Charlie came home with the groceries, I didn't mention what I had done. Throughout dinner, I kept trying to think of how I would explain what happened. Are you feeling any better, George? Uh, sort of. I was thinking you could play that piece that you'd been working on with Sarah for me. It's been a good earworm for me most of the day, and you could help me shake it by playing it a few times. Charlie, there's something I have to tell you about the piano. I did it while you were gone. I shoveled the broccoli around on my plate with my fork avoiding eye contact. What do you mean? Charlie scrunched up his eyebrows. It will probably be better if you see it for yourself. I walked with Charlie to the basement. As we rounded the last corner to the center of the room, I let Charlie go first so he could see it. I heard him starting to giggle. I quickly rounded the corner to join him. That is not exactly the response I thought you'd have. I froze. The piano was back in the center of the room unscathed. The hood was propped open, and a large patio umbrella was propped up over top of it. Well, this is absolutely ridiculous. Are you expecting rain down here? Charlie put his hands on his hips and shook his head as he continued to giggle. I stormed out of the room without saying a word to Charlie. What's the punchline, sport? I heard him call after me. I swear that bitch of a piano was grinning at me as I walked away. I went to my room to rethink my approach. This was going to take a lot more work than simply reading a book. That concludes episode 16. Thanks so much. My name's George Tate. Thank you for listening. As always, the story was written and conceived by yours truly. The music was also played and composed by myself or arranged by myself as well, since there were elements of Chopin's Funeral March in there and used as we usually tend to do. If you haven't shared this lately, or if you haven't yet written a free review for us on any of the podcast platforms, please do. iTunes is one of the best places that you can do that. If you want to leave us a note over on our website, we now have a thriving comment section, or rather, a wonderful place for you to put a comment right below the podcast player of our shiny new website, which we are still designing, and we should have it all complete and completely live on the 16th of the month. As always, thanks so much for listening. I'm George Tate, and trust me, you've waited a long time, and believe me when I say, I'll be back next Monday.